Have you ever imagined a world without light and shadow? It will be super flat, right? Today we have Chris Palmer who brightens up the CG and VFX industry through his impressive lighting skill. Chris has been in the industry for more than 10 years. He worked on a variety of TV shows, animation and feature films. Let's hear what Chris has to say and how we make lighting so easier. It's going to be a lot of valuable information, so grab a pen and paper and take some notes. My career has kind of gone from promotional uh, products to magazine covers to product rendering. I dealt with Xbox um, hardware. I dealt with uh, uh, Microsoft hardware doing like keyboards and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> all through product rendering. I did uh, a lot of television, uh, a lot of live action television, a lot of um, animation television, and then I moved into uh, visual effects feature film and animation feature film. Um, so I kind of have touched quite a lot in regards to lighting. A lot of people think that lighting is just TV or it's movies and it's not. So it, you have like a bunch of little pockets of places that you can work that people just don't know about coming, like coming out of college. So, um, See, where should I start? Where should I start? So, uh, let's, what was uh, it like, let's go with the demorial and you can explain a bit about your demorial, what you did, and what kind of shots. And uh, yeah, we can go from there. Sure, sure. All right. So, everybody can see my screen, yeah? Yeah, yeah we can. Well, I guess everybody's muted. So, okay. So, we'll, um, just real quick, we'll go through here. Um, I also did modeling for a long time as a generalist. So, I kind of did certain pieces of modeling. It's just like I'm a big Star Wars fan, so I kind of set up, you know, modeling and stuff like that. But from lighting standpoints, uh, I worked with the HoloLens, which um, basically is a 3D scan of an actual object that I cleaned up, did the surfacing for, did the uh, the lighting for, and then uh, this was actually shown in the launch for Windows 10, which was really cool. Um, the head of Microsoft actually came and stood behind me while I was working on it. I didn't know who he was until I saw him on TV like a week later. That's one of the most surreal things I think I've ever had to do. Um, uh, the magazine cover that I had worked on, the Ozine magazine cover, which was probably one of the biggest fun projects I've ever done uh, in the beginning of my career. And it was actually kind of a fluke that we got this uh, from where I was working, but it was quite the project. It was really cool. Um, we learned quite a lot on this this uh, this little project for a magazine cover. So, but the demo reel, like I said, I've worked in both animation and visual effects. So this is my animation demo reel. And then we'll just go ahead and let that play, so you guys can see that. Yeah, Chris, it would be good, like, you know, you can tell us, like, what you did in that demo reel, so it's easier, like, for example, sure, in the sure. yeah. Um, so in this, I did a lot of lighting and lighting for this shot. Um, what we did from the start, we had, like, a master lighter who basically kind of created lights for this bar that this, this shot is in. This is actually part of the animated feature film Smallfoot, uh, produced by Sony. And what we did, or what I had to do was, I lit the character, the background uh, came in pre-lit, but I had to composite it together in order to be able to fit. Um, there was a lot of parameters that we had to adjust since the camera was so close to the neon lights and the way it was set up. And then we had to basically just um, the pig, everything that is on phone it's actually an after effect. So this is um, this is also from Smallfoot. Uh, we had a master lighter that did this and doing um, who sets up the scene, uh, kind of like you know just your your first key shot, and then the rest of us kind of come in from behind and we take what it is that he has done and we implement it into our scenes. 
dealing with fur, especially at Sony, which is it's they have their own propri- proprietary software, uh, was actually more um, easy to deal with than I expected. However, compositing little flyaway hairs and fixing little flyaway hairs that was quite a challenge. This same thing, same thing kind of goes with this. This is the Willoughby's. This was uh, done by Braun Studios here in Vancouver. Uh, it was actually in production for, I think, about three years before it even got to the lighting department. Um, so we came in. We had an art director who had a very um, specific look that he had in mind. Basically, everything that you see on this show, like the way that it looks, the way that it feels, is exactly what he painted in his color scripts. Like he didn't really deviate from it, like at all. If you know, if he did, it was very, very small. Um, lots of compositing, mostly. These I actually set up. Uh, this shot in here. This is actually one of my key shots that I have done. Um, meaning like, you know, it's the first shot in a sequence that you see the characters together and you are basically setting up the lighting file, the compositing file, um, for other artists to take over. So that's kind of what I did on these. These are also the same thing. These were also key shot master shots. This was a television show. This is Troll Hunter. Some of you might have seen this. This is actually from DreamWorks. Um, they started doing troll hunters back in like 2015 it is actually one of the shows that brought me from um atlanta georgia up to toronto canada uh, i worked on this show i worked on um how to train your dragon the television series this was actually a lot of fun the team working at arc studios before it went down was quite amazing everybody was really talented it was super nice. I learned a lot on this show, uh, especially a lot in regards to compositing and tips and tricks that I didn't ever think about beforehand. Um, more small foot, just different lighting scenarios, uh, lots of characters. This was actually the first shot I ever lit on that show, which was really cool because dealing with the surfacing of the snow, stuff that you just would not think about, they actually went and looked at snow and you could see like the fringing here, the way it turns a little yellow or a little pink. Uh, it's how light interacts with ice in real life. And that was what they were trying to, to like implement into all the, the lighting scenarios with the snow and the ice. It was actually really cool. Um, this is another, like one of the first shots I probably did uh, on the Willoughby's. Um, a lot of stuff takes place in these uh, areas of the room. There's a lot of stuff involved. Um, this shot in particular, it looks the, the lighting tricks that you wouldn't think you would need to do were if you look at the characters, you have a light, like a, like a kicker kind of going on right here and a kicker going on him right here. And then they switch positions. So basically we had to animate lights on and off in order to get them to look like they were switching positions because the way that the artist originally had set it up, it wasn't just one light, which you would think would be the way that you would approach it. But due to technical issues, we had to find massive workarounds in order to get it to work correctly. So it was a challenge, but it turned out really, really well. This is How to Train Your Dragon. This is the show that brought me up to Toronto from Atlanta. Um, I learned a lot from my lead dealing with this, uh, the same as Tibor works, just wonders, um, still parts of the Willoughby's. This was my entire sequence that I was a sequence lead on. Uh, some of the challenges that we had dealing with this was that this entire uh, candy factory is a big reflective ball. And in order to be able to get uh, shape and all of these reflective like materials and stuff like that. We had to create rotos, like individual rotos and masks in order to get it to look the way that it looks. So it just didn't come out of the renders that way. We had to 
fake all sorts of stuff in here. Hey, Chris, is, um, so you worked as a lighting artist uh, as well as a lead and uh, as a sequence uh, artist as well, right? So can you talk about like difference between the lighting artist and the sequence lead? Uh, is there any difference um, about that? Yeah, um, it kind of really depends on where you are in your career. Um, as a lighting artist, you can be anywhere between a junior uh, to a senior, and you just be a regular shot lighter. Um, usually, lighters, just regular straight lighting, compositing artists that are like juniors or intermediates are lighting um, child shots or maybe one-offs, which is basically someone has already established a look and has already set up your Maya files, your Katana files, your Houdini files, and has already set up a nuke script uh, for you to use. And then basically what it is, is you come in, you copy their lights from their Maya file, Katana file, what have you, and you also copy their nuke scripts. And some studios actually have propagation tools where it will create that for you. And basically it's just plug and play. You, the lighting's already established, all of the, the look and the, the color corrections and stuff like that to the renders themselves are already done. And so basically you're just polishing if things need to be polished or if things need to be adjusted ever so slightly uh, for a child shot, which is not really all that common, but it, it is, you know, it, you, you do do that, but it's not as common, especially in television. Um, and then as a sequence lead or a key, key lighting artist or a master shot lighting artist that usually comes with someone who is more of a senior um, or who has more experience in lighting in that pipeline for that studio and they know how things work uh, and but usually it's more or less a, a senior artist um, you're creating the look from a color script and you are setting up your shots or setting up that one shot to be fed out to other artists. And as a sequence lead, usually that's your main focus is to make sure that everything is optimized, everything is clear to other artists um, that, you know, hey, this color correct is affecting this object or this light is lighting this object and this object alone, or you are optimizing basically for faster render times or, you know, a reduction in noise and you're going to give these to your to your artists and then once your artists start propagating their their shots they start compos compositing their shots depending on the studio that you are working at a sequence lead will take a look at everybody's shots before we send it to uh the lighting supervisors or to put it in dailies for review uh from your supervisors or the art director you're looking for continuity you know, as, as a, as a sequence lead, you know, like does all the colors match? Does the shadows need to be lifted? You know, small things that you will catch because you were more intimately involved with the look of that sequence. And then as a lighting lead, you have a whole different ball game. Uh, working at rocket science where I met Dinesh, I became a lighting lead about eight months into it. Um, I basically oversaw quite a few artists, I think it was like seven artists at any given time, sometimes eight, depending on what show I was on or if I had to help out on other shows. Basically, as a lighting lead, you solve the problems that your artists are having. Um, you're going into rounds with your supervisor and you are coming up with solutions to make these shots work. Is that, whether that's lighting, like lighting direction, whether that is surfacing notes, whether or not uh, compositing notes, um, anything and everything to get the shot in and out. And you have to do everything you can to make sure that your lighting artists have what they need to be able to get the end result that you and your supervisor are looking for. Now, lighting leads, their roles change from company to company and project to project, working on uh, visual effects television like we did at Rocket Science. My 
responsibility sometimes bled into surfacing. It bled into help figure out rigging issues if things need to be fixed because we're getting it on our end that we're having issues with certain rigs. Um, you're also dealing with compositing, uh, especially within visual effects because it's lighting. Usually you have what's called a slap comp and you get your lighting, you slap it in nuke, you get it kind of looking, yeah, I think this is how it's going to look. I think this will be pretty cool. And then you send it over to a comp artist and then they finish the rest of it. They add all that extra special sauce to it. You know, all the, the lens flares, the uh, aberrations, you know, all, all that little extra added stuff that you don't realize goes into making a shot look the way that it does. That, that's what they do. Um, working at Method, we just did uh, slap comps and basically if you, uh, leads at Method, they were um, basically big liaisons between all the departments. And they also were very technical, more so than probably being in a television, um, a television lead, lighting lead position. But they knew technical stuff from fur attributes and fur issues to rigging problems to surfacing problems. And then they had quite a lot of technical background for lighting or creating GUIs or anything in everything you could think of in order to make the lighting artist have an easier time because the name of the game in lighting is that you need to get it done fast but you need to get it done as accurate as possible but you need to be able to have the tools to do that um and that kind of like i said like that varies between studio to studio feature film and visual effects completely different ballgame yeah, Chris, so, uh, that was a quite a you know progression in your demo reel as well as in your career. Um, it was uh, uh, pretty amazing. Um, so when you talked about lighting and everything, uh, you talked about color scripts, right? So can you explain like what are color scripts? Uh, for example, I know what are color scripts. They usually paint and give it to you. But like, what if if you have a challenge, like uh, you have to light a shot like out of the blue, you don't have color scripts. Like, how do you handle that? Mm. Well, usually, um, if you don't have a color script for certain areas, you usually color scripts are more prevalent in animated films. They are they, they do show up in visual effects films as an overall whole of an idea of what something needs to look like. Um, but in animation, usually, if you don't have a color script for a certain area, you use other areas of the film as a starting point. So let's say, uh, we'll take the Willoughby's for example. A lot of that stuff was really, really warm. Uh, lots of golds and reds and oranges and stuff like that. So it was pretty much established that if you were inside, everything's gonna be very warm. So that's kind of where you start. You just start with the warm tones. If it's outside and it's cold and there's snow, obviously everything's gonna be blue because you want it to feel cold. There won't be anything warm unless you have a torch or a flare or something like that, or skin. If you want the children, or you want a person or whatever uh, is living to feel like it's alive, you wanna keep them warm. And then every, in the surrounding area is cold. And then usually you'll add rim lights in that are blue, which will help accentuate the fact that it's cold. Vice versa, if it's warm, you'll be doing warm rims and stuff like that. So that's usually where you start if you don't have a color script. And then as you present to your art director, your CG supervisors, your lighting supervisors, they will give you more direction. Um, but usually before you get started, you have that conversation with them going, okay, this is what I'm thinking about, ha thinking about doing. I'm going to go in this direction. Is that what you're thinking? We're doing it cold. We're doing it warm. Is it, are we in a jungle? We'll have a little bit of some green lighting, maybe some blue lighting for the shadows or even like a yellow light to kind of help pump that green feel to things. And they'll either say yay or nay, or they'll say model it after this sequence. And then you'll, you can go off with that. Now in visual effects, usually, <clears throat> you'll take like concept art, uh, like for instance, what 
Dinesh and I did when we worked on um, uh, the expanse. We had a space inside of a spaceship. We had one basic concept art, and then we I took like an element of it, like sun was supposedly coming from this direction, and then it ran from there. So we had an instance where the sun was basically this tube that went down this spacecraft, and I started from there, and I made it warm, and then I started adding in fills, and then we kind of went from there at making, if you depending on what the feel and the look is, that's the colors that you that you go to go towards, and then usually you get direction from there once you start presenting that, um, and that's usually kind of how you get around that. Yeah, that's a quite a workflow, work, Chris, uh, for sure. Uh, do you guys have any other questions so far for Chris? I think I'll take Salta's answer. If you guys, <laughs> if you, yeah. Oh, yeah, question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, I do. Yeah, uh, I'm absolutely new to this. So, like, my mind's racing with all the possible things. That, uh, I mean, I'm just catching on to all the different uh, industry uh, lingo that you guys are throwing around. Uh, but one of the questions I have uh, is: there any like scripting involved on your part, Chris? And what I mean by that is scripting where you're creating like GUI, real-time tweaking, essentially the equivalent of rigs, animation rigs, but for lights. I don't know. Help you uh, in real time uh, reviewing? Real time reviewing? I don't know if that makes sense. Well, see if I can answer part of that question and then maybe we can get to the, the okay. root of it. Um, the, we do have light rigs. Um, what we will do okay. is you'll, cre you'll create a sunlight um, and then usually you have a fill light, a key light, uh, rim lights, stuff like that. And then that is put into a folder in, uh, or a group, basically, inside Maya or even in Katana, which is a completely different program that's more complicated. So we'll just stick with Maya for right now. So you'll put that into a group, and that's all together. And then you can move that group wherever you want, and all the lights stay together. And that will be a, a light rig. You can create handles that will control lights or you can create rigs to where um, wherever you move the camera in 3D space, a light will move in the same direction to, mat to where, no matter where the camera, wherever the camera is in regards to a character, it will always have a rim light and it will be perfect every time. So we'll create those light rigs and through expressions and constraints, no matter where you move a camera, you'll always have a rim on character. Now, as in regards to scripting to create GUIs for lighting, um, it's really, that, that, that gets to be very specific, uh, depending on what it is that you're wanting. Like, lots of GUIs and stuff like that in Maya are, you know, they, they, it brings in a light rig for you that was already created from somewhere else. Or, that GUI creates AOVs, which are, do you, do you know what AOVs are? Uh, I think you I guess not. Yeah, um, I think you yeah. Basically what an AOV is, is if you were to take your render and slice it into a thousand pieces and then put it back together again, an AOV is one of those thousand pieces. So it'll be your reflection pass, your specular pass, it'll be your subsurface pass. We have GUIs that will create those for us, but that's not at every studio. So that's that's basically from studio to studio, and those vary. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, hopefully. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Guys, do you have any other questions? Uh, Think, uh, I think I'm good. I, although I saw pop up that said Kim had a question. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, I don't get a question, so I was asking. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if it's the same for like all the steps you do, for like the things that you worked on, for like TV to the product um, and magazines that you said that you mentioned. It is. 
the uh, so so are you asking like do I do the same thing yeah. every single time for every single project? Yeah, or is it like different? Is there like something different that you do for like um, advertisements as opposed to like when you work on a film? Yes, it's all it. It the principles are the same, but the approach is different. Um, so for like TV and feature film. It's usually pretty much the same. Um, you're basically in, in regards to setting things up and getting things out. Um, product rendering is a completely different beast. You get so creative when creating stuff for product renders because the people that you deal with in product rendering are not artists in the slightest. They are graphic design artists, they are designers, they are uh, creators in a completely different way. They have nothing to do with 3D at all. They deal with 2D, they deal with Photoshop, and they have a vision and they don't understand how light works in real life because they can just paint it in Photoshop. So you have to figure out a way to get them, to get them the result that they want. So. For instance, the, the hollow lens, that sunglass look at this, the sunglasses looking thing that I showed you yeah. from Microsoft, from Microsoft, yeah. the reflection on that, that goes across like the lens itself was, was actually not a real light. It was a sphere that we kind of cut into sections and then we turned uh, we, we put a surface shader on it that was white and then we turned on global illumina global illumination and it basically acted as a light and then it gave you that reflection that kind of went right across the lens that they were looking for and it was a last ditch effort to figure out a way to get the proper reflections on on that lens so when you're looking at uh, even like something for a computer mouse, you are basically what the way that you want to approach something in regards to the product rendering is you, it has to look sexy as hell. That's basically what they're going to ask you. Doesn't matter. Just make it sexy because sexy sells. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of, you know, not in, not in the demeaning sense, but you need to make someone look at this mouse, this headphones and go, wow, I want to buy that. That looks good. So it's just approaching it differently. Light rigs really aren't a thing. You're putting, you're putting ramps inside of lights to fade things out. You're adding images inside of your light, like soft boxes uh, that are going inside of a light that will diffuse the light like it does in real life. If you were to use that, like you were going to be doing photography and, and uh, taking a picture of it. So you approach that in a completely different way. And architectural design, when you're doing architectural lighting, as a lighting artist, you have to have even more of an understanding on how light actually works because what sells is the fact that that lighting and the fact that the shading and everything else that you're looking at looks hyper realistic. They want you to look at it and go, oh, I can't tell that that's a 3D render. That's a photograph simple one took. But that building does not exist on the planet. So you have to have a more realistic view on how light interacts with objects in regards to architectural renderings. But TV and visual effects and uh, animation, you have a little bit more artistic discretion. If that helps if that if that answers your question <laughs> yeah thanks yeah that's a really good uh, uh, question and uh, answer as well chris okay let's go to the next uh, part of this uh, session uh, we usually ask uh, people who come in here and we will ask them to uh, like show us their personal work you know like give like workflow what's their thought process began it so the one thing i respect about chris he doesn't do that much personal work because he does a lot of photography and uh, if I go and check my Instagram, check his Instagram, I always think about like when he takes a picture, he thinks about lighting. 
I think that's his thought process. But he's going to present us uh, his post creation uh, he created for uh, for Wizard of Oz, right? Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. Yep. So can you tell us about like, um, like what you did in this, you know, what was your approach? Like, what are your thought process and like how you got inspired? Like, how did you come up with the idea and stuff like that? So this was kind of a collaborated effort, which was really cool. Um, the thought process of how this came about actually came from another, like an ad that we put in. We had, a, we had a created a little robot and we made an ad for Crawford Media and they liked it so much. They were like, hey, we want to give you, we want to give you the cover of OZ Magazine here in Atlanta. So we as a, as a group started spitballing ideas and we had this super talented concept artist named Travis Overstreet who created like the, the, the ninja guy and the little uh, mice, which is funny because they're like Mickey Mouse on steroids. Um, we were actually still in school and we were doing 2D animation. We all, we all had it. The, the rigging artist, Bianca Gee, who actually works at Sony uh, here in Vancouver, and then myself and then Travis, we all were still like an advanced 2D animation. So we wanted to portray that in, in, some of our, uh, in some of our concept arts. So the little circular thing on the mouse's stomach is actually an animation light table. So, and then these little arrows are, you know, they're like your little mouse cursor. And then the little ninja guy is basically us as artists, I guess, if you really want to think about it, you're coming in, you're killing 2D animation, and you're going to do some 3D stuff, and you're just going to make it look awesome. So that, that was kind of like the whole thought process behind it. So we created this, this rope, or created this little ninja guy, and we started playing around with a bunch of colors, and we started playing around with mice. And this was kind of like our first go at playing with fur and lighting subsurface uh, objects and, you know, this techie looking object, we had no clue what we were doing. So we really tried multiple, multiple things. So basically the only thing that's 3D in this picture is the guy and the three little, uh, the three little mice and then the ground plane. And the ground plane was just gray. And so everything else is matte painting. And then basically what we did or what I did was I took the matte painting of the sky and the moon and where everything was. And then I used that as my lighting source. And then we knew that the ground was going to be like this dirty post-apocalyptic, you know, feel. So we had all this brown bounce light coming up. So the process from start to finish was, <laughs> to be honest, it came out of from a, a lack of sleep because we were all doing senior projects at that point in time. And we really just wanted to do something completely different, completely off the wall, a little bit grotesque, and just really push our creative skills as far as we could. And that was the first time I ever did fur. Uh, I created the fur. I kind of sculpted it in there, tried to get it to look correct, but we wanted it to be a little raggedy, like they were, they all had the mange, and it was just one thing after another. It was probably one of the coolest creative projects I had been on um, outside of school, and probably the most collaborative project I've been on to date, to be honest. Yeah. Because I haven't really... <laughs> it, it does show uh, in the work, you know, I really like the uh, the composition of it, it's kind of like, once I see the picture, it's just literally going to the ninja guy. Mm -hmm. That's a real uh, cool thing about it. So, 
So how long yeah. has it uh, took you guys to do this? Two weeks. Oh, nice. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Well, we we had we had to get it done in two weeks. Oh, okay. uh, what two weeks? No, I think it was three. I lied. I think it was three, three because weeks, okay. it took us a week of spitballing it, and then we had two weeks to get it done. And keep in mind, we were doing senior projects, like senior animated films. Also, like three weeks or probably about two months away from graduating college, and uh, you know, like. Myself and Travis were older students. We had jobs that we were going to. Um, that we, you know, we had lives. We had families at home. We were, we did quite a lot. So we would work on this throughout the day, and then stay at work, and then do our senior projects at the office to get it all done. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Um, yeah, it was pretty wild. Yeah. So, do you guys have any other questions uh, based on his personal work? Uh, think uh, i guess not um so we can go to the next part of this uh, meetup so like whoever comes to our uh, meetup event uh, i usually have a questioner i ask this 10 questions to every artist to see like what they feel about it and how their thought process and um, how they being you know saying of being an artist so let's jump into the next part of it and uh, yeah Chris, do you want to add anything else or? Uh, no, no, I'm good. Let's let's uh, okay. go to the next. Yep. Okay, let's do this. Um, how do you feel being part of this uh, booming CG industry? Pretty thankful, to be honest. Uh, especially right now, bearing with what's going on in the world. Um, it's... To me, being a part of the industry is gives me a creative outlet, and that satisfaction of being cre- being creative, and I come home completely fulfilled in regards to what it is that I do for a living. I had a career before this in sales and marketing, and hated it. And being a part of the CG industry literally has made my life happier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um... So, what uh, sparked your interest um, come like like coming into this industry? Oh, that's an, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, it, I used to models, and I used to build cars and airplanes, and fascinated with the cockpits and spaceships and trying to create. As deep as I possibly could, uh, because I, just, I had this need, that, and I was. Hey, and Chris, uh, when I, I realized, hey, Chris, that, I like, think you are keep on breaking. I don't know why. <clears throat> am, I, am I breaking up? Did y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can okay. hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and as and as a kid, you know, I was a big Star Wars fan. And then my dad told me that the X wings and all the spaceships and the Death Star were all models. They were actual practical models. And I was like, Oh my God, I want to do that for a living. I have to do that. And I have to work on Star Wars. I have to. I still have to. I haven't yet, but I still have to. <laughs> you will. One and day. yeah, one of these days I will. <laughs> Uh, but when I graduated college or when I graduated, uh, high school and was going into college, Pixar had just released Toy Story. The CG animation industry was like really non-existent at that point in time. So when I went back to school and I had my other career, I ended up going back to doing models and I was like, oh my God, this isn't what I wanted. I had a client who used to be an animator on the television show Animaniacs. And when I started talking to him, found out his brother also used to make um, the toys for Nasbro. He would sculpt the Ninja Turtles and G.I. Joes and stuff like that. He even worked on Barbie at one point in time, I think. And so when I started talking to him, he told me about the CG industry and how it was really like this up and coming like industry, it's going to be great. You can make lots and lots of money. And I was like, oh my God, maybe that's what I can do for a living. 
because professional model builders or practical model builders is such a hard industry to get into and it's a dying industry. So I chose CG to be able to do 3D modeling, texturing and animation. And then, and I, as for as long as I can remember, I also had this obsession with photography. And so I started off as a modeler and an animator and then literally turned from that into my love of lighting and photography. And then that became my career. I still model, I still texture with subs or with um, um, substance and stuff like that every once in a while, but it's rare. I don't really have the time to do that anymore. But um, that's that's how I, it led me to this industry. Oh, nice. Um, that's like quite uh, inspiring as well. So let's move on to the next question. So how do you find your aspirations uh, or motivations as an artist? That kind of depends. Mm -hmm. um, my aspirations, like to be a better artist and to work on certain projects, has always kind of been one of those, like a bucket list for me. It's like, uh, I want to work on Star Wars. That's, that's the, the if, if I work on Star Wars and I die tomorrow, I, I, I had a good life. <laughs> but, um, you know, working on a Marvel film, I wanted to work on a feature film. I wanted to work on an animation feature film. So I made those goals for me as aspirations just to reach. And then I started reaching them and I started just taking them off. And getting motivation to, to do that is that I see some of, the, some of these artists that I work with every day and they've worked on some of this amazing stuff and they're most down to earth people ever. And I'm like, you just talking to them and becoming friends with them, like <laughs> motivates me personally yeah. to do more, you know, and my partner, she also works as a lighter uh, and she, she, she's so smart with the way she approaches things and it motivates me to learn as much as I can from other people uh, just so that I can progress you know, in my own, in, in my own career. So I, I get my motivation from the people I sit next to every day. And then I get motivation for myself because of what my aspirations are mm -hmm. that motivates me to, to continue to move forward. And then to make really awesome stuff, like the satisfaction of making really cool shit. It's <laughs> such a driver. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, that like, you have a different thought process. I never imagined like that, you know, like you get motivated by other artists. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, what are some creative suggestions that can be applied in CG industry or VFX industry? What, what do you mean by like creative suggestions? Um, like some advice or like some kind of like creative suggestions that can improve CG industry. Ah, um, I think something that a lot of people don't think about is burnout. Mm -hmm. Um, that is that that's on us as artists and that's on the industry as a whole. Um, I think as a suggestion for the industry, would be, you know, plan better. <laughs> uh, a lot of the times as a, as a lighting artist and a compositing artist, the buck stops with us. Uh, in animation, like you are finishing this project, like you're, you, you light it, you composite it, and we put it onto the screen and then the viewer consumes this content. Visual effects, you're lighting it, you're giving it to a comp artist and they finish it. And usually at the end of the line, you're working hours upon hours of overtime late into the night, you're exhausted, you're making mistakes, and then you forget to walk away from your computer. You forget that you're human and you need to take a break. Um, that as that would be a massive suggestion. It's like, you know, certain, certain studios do this and it's not every studio, but it's, I think as a suggestion for artists and for studios in general is remember that there are humans that are in the seats that are creating this. And a lot of studios have done that, but there are studios that still have yet to learn that. Um, because the industry is very tight net. I mean, it is, it's very, very close. If you worked at one studio, 
you go to the next, you go to the next, you've probably worked with just about everybody in your town. So everybody knows, like, if I go to this studio, I'm going to be exhausted. Or if I go here, I'm going to have an amazing time. Their benefits are great or the projects are awesome. The supervisors are awesome. So I think that as a suggestion would yeah. be something to just to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, but, but creatively as an artist, the biggest suggestion I could probably say is always be open to suggestions. You, I have learned things from a junior right out of college that I would have probably never learned from a CG supervisor who has 25 years of experience. So uh, yeah, yeah, I actually I can relate to it because like um, I read a quote: "You can learn anything from anyone, like even from a kid." Yeah, I mean, because it, it's our industry is so fast paced that everything changes, and where someone coming right out of college or right out of their basement or right out of their right out of their bedroom, they probably know more because they've researched something new. And then they bring that into like a small boutique store and it's, they become the next ILM or the next uh, DD or DNEG just because of one small thing. Like look at the renderer Redshift. It came out of a need to stop using your CPUs to render yeah. and started using your graphics card. And I mean, it's just stuff like that. You, you know, it's always changing and Basically, people who come after us are always going to be smarter because they're just they're going to grow up with more of it. <laughs> yeah, that's reality of life. Uh, reality of life, right? So, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, let's move on to the next question. Um, what was the most fun creative work have you done? It would probably be the OZ magazine cover. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you talked about it. Like as soon as I yeah. I was asking that question, I was thinking about that. So. Um, yeah. So let's move on to the next one. Um, what are some challenges you faced before working in this industry? Before working in the industry, or yeah. what are some challenges you faced before working in this industry? Yeah, yeah, before working in this industry, um, finding my place. I think that's a little deep, but uh, yeah, it does. Yeah, the, yeah. the The challenge for me was to find what I needed out of life in regards to being fulfilled with my life. Um, I knew there was more for me and I knew what it, what it was going to make me and ha make me happy in life was going to be doing something creative. And I am not going to lie. It was very difficult. The f first five years, very difficult going to school, working full time, uh, getting my first job before graduating college, uh, about a year before graduating and then being let go two weeks before I graduated. And it was, it was one stumbling block after another, but perseverance and just pure stubbornness got me to where I am. And that's pretty much what I learned before coming into this industry that you needed to have so that you could succeed. So that is a continuous challenge for me, you know, to, to, to continue to think in that manner. This is to keep pushing forward because you're always going to have a stumbling block. Yeah. So yeah, it does, you know, like your hard work and um, your passion for lighting shows in your work. So uh, there is no doubt about it. Um, let's move on to the next question. And um, what advice would you give someone entering CG industry? Work a lot at home. Do not wait for someone to give you a job. You, you can make whatever your little heart desires. You don't have to have some, you don't, you don't have to have anybody tell you what to make in order to make art. Um, starting off with the industry, a lot of people will ask you, Hey, have you done anything personal? Do you, do you have any personal work? And, you know, life is busy, you know, you got to pay your bills, but if you just take some time out and do something small, like get on, uh, get on some of these, these sites, these concept art sites and pick, pick something, pick a scene, pick a character, pick a small object, whatever it is, and just do it. Uh, I know some people 
who have made challenges for themselves, I have a, a one day project. I'm going to do this in one day and that's it. Whatever it is, that's it. I have, you know, they do it in a week. They do it in two weeks. Um, just do it. I had to do that. I'm sure Dinesh has to, had to have done that. I know lots of my friends back in Atlanta had to do that. If it was not for me thinking outside the box and doing my own personal stuff and just late, late nights creating artwork, that's what got me to where I am. You can, you can talk to a lot of people and probably 90% of those people did the work late at night after they got home from work and that's what got them to where they are now. Yeah, it's uh, Chris, it's a dose of reality um, because like in, in order to survive in an industry, we just have to put in a lot of work. But I think uh, what are you telling about like the passion not to be there to yeah. get into this industry? That's kind of like a dose of reality right there. Um, yeah, I mean, and that shows through when yeah. you're in an interview mm -hmm. and you're talking about your work and you're passionate about your work. There, there, there is a saying about 60% of an interview is your personality. The other 40% is your work. Because if you as a person are passionate about what it is that you do, that they're going to be more apt to hire you than the guy who's a, who's dull because they want someone that's passionate and that means you're going to do a good job. Yeah, totally. So. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next question. Um, what do you think about the future of the CG industry? Oh God. Uh, I, that answer would have been completely different last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that things are going to become more automated. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it will go the same way as most industries do. Uh, my original career was supposed was my first degree was in broadcasting. I was going to go and work at a television station. Uh, when I graduated, all of those jobs became automated. They didn't need people anymore. So now the things that are becoming, becoming automated are certain parts of render wrangling, um, lighting, you know, they're starting to have algorithms to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, now that we're working from home or people are working from home, I think that the industry will hopefully some some parts of the industry will be able to work from home. Uh, rigging artists will be able to stay at home. Modeling artists can stay at home. You just need your own. You just need a box at the house. You can work in Connecticut and be working for a company in Vancouver. Yeah. You know, I I see that happening. Uh, lighting usually it's they're wanting you inside the studio so that you can talk with your supervisors. And sometimes the lag is a little too much to handle. However, working at Zoic Studios and at Method Studios, we had a small little box that basically would ping your box that was in LA and there was no lag. They can give that to us. We can work from home. You know, I, I see that being a, a big thing coming in the future. Um, the future of the industry with hyper realistic texturing and rendering and new compositing uh, techniques take the Mandalorian for instance they're get they're they're putting backgrounds on LED monitors that do not flicker so that means that they don't need to have a matte painting anymore they they just have like an image that someone took that's behind a practical set I mean it's that's amazing yeah so the industry in regards to lighting is still up in the air, but, um, I mean, it's, there's still a need, but it will be, I, I see the future, see the future for at least for, for, for my part of the industry being pretty bright. Uh, it, it'll just, it'll look different, but it'll, it'll still be very, very bright. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with it because like the ritual pre-production coming along with Unreal, so so most other things going to be automated, but like still they need people to go and clean up everything as well. So, yeah, I mean, if people are doing stuff in Unreal now, Maya is going to be obsolete. <laughs> and Katana, everything. Yeah. I mean, Unreal is so powerful. Yeah. It, it'll be, 
there people are looking for lighters in unreal <laughs> yeah so i'm planning to bring in some people for unreal in my uh, meetup event as well but like it's in future i'm going department by department so if some if i nice. have someone yeah i'll send you a link you can pop in yeah please do yeah so uh this is the last question and um what are some of your art related hobbies um photography okay. a lot of it is photography photo editing uh i have started a youtube channel um i'm teaching myself videography um i'm wanting to document and create things that are not cg um you know my basically it kind of came down to me wanting to document things for my family who are thousands of miles away from me um so that they can see how my life is or what adventures and stuff I go on and that kind of sparked this whole small obsession with you know learning film and being able to tell stories because I've always been a storyteller so why not use that as another way to be creative um it's complete it's it's in the same realm for what it is that I kind of do for a living in being in film but it's not CG and then photography you know i'm dealing with light and the way that i view the world through like a camera lens so it all kind of leads in together uh so those are kind of more or less my hobbies um now so oh thanks chris um so guys uh we almost at the end of the session do you guys have any other question for chris I can relate to a lot to what you said about your challenges like when you were trying to find your place before you yeah. in the street. So after your first uh degree you work you work before going back to school for animation, right? Mm-hmm. So what was it like that journey? Like at what point did you decide to go back to school? and how did you like um like i guess overcome all your challenges at that point because i'm i'm literally at that point uh, it, it, it was um i was i was sitting at work it was late at night i was reading a book and it hit me that i had gone to school for the wrong thing and it was devastating to me um and it i have i'm very lucky to have had a best friend who is the closest thing that i have to a brother help me through that realization and letting me know that it was okay to go back to school um because i was like oh crap i've spent all this money i i, I made a big mistake I, i'm screwed Yeah. You're not you're not you're not. One door closes, another door always opens and if that door closes, a window will open. And the challenge for me was being an older student going back to school. Uh I I I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I was a a football college and you know, we partied all the time and then I went to this very prestigious art art college. uh Savannah College of Art and Design completely different ball game my head as an older student was a lot more focused i didn't have time for kids i didn't have time to play around and i wasn't drinking and partying or doing whatever i paid for that education myself i'm still paying for that education um but the challenge for me was overcome by like my stress of not being able to eat dinner sometimes my my stress of going oh god i can't pay my bills because i have to do my homework and i can't go serve tables or you know stuff like that i knew i wanted this so bad and at the 11th hour everything worked and basically what got me through all of that was my faith in that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and because I knew that was what I was supposed to be doing so 
if you were passionate about what it is that you want to do, or you, you, you're like, I, I just, I really want to do this, then do it and have the faith in yourself that you are on the right path. And so getting over those challenges, going through school was very difficult, but I had to keep reminding myself that this is where I, where I am supposed to be. And then getting my first job and then losing my first job was devastating, but that's how the industry is. And then you just go to the next, you go to the next, uh, in our industry, the biggest thing is the people that, you know, you know, you need to know you, you make your friends, you, um, you, you stay connected to those people and they will help you. You know, no one has gotten to where they are today without standing on the backs of other people because those people are going to be your foundation and they are going to lift you up even higher. And then in turn, you are going to do that for them when they need you. And so that's how you get to where you want to be. So I know that's a little deep, but going back into school and, and, and going down this path, it's scary. But when you get out on the other side, you're going to feel a lot better. So, because you're going to be so much more gratified with what it is that you do every day. And then you have something every day that you're proud of that you have done. And that feeling of being proud from the work that you have produced it you, you can't replace that feeling with anything as an artist. You, you, you can't replace that feeling. That's, that's what you need, you know, a lot of the time. Yeah. So well, I hope that, I hope that helped. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. Um, thanks, Ken. Thanks uh, for your question. Hi, OJ here. Uh, just, uh, I do have a question here. Uh, this is probably for for Dinesh as well, uh, as well as Chris. Based on both of your guys' experience, like, uh, how much of the industry is like how much of people in the industry right now are self-taught as compared to went through a specific art school or an animation specific school? Or, yeah, I'm just basically learning in my basement right now. There's a lot of information online. There are a lot of courses online. And I don't think I have the, uh, yeah, I don't have the finances to go back to school for this. I'm learning at an online uh, school. Right away. <laughs> I'm just learning right now, playing in Blender, looking at YouTube videos and just, yeah. Well, um, okay, let me, let me ask this. Uh, OJ and Kim, where are you guys located? Are you in Canada? Yes. I'm in Mississauga. Yep. Toronto. Neutron. Oh, nice. All right. Cool, cool. Um, I, here in Canada, I, I, know, I know a few people who have never gone to college, and they have jobs. Um, a lot of people do come here. They go to school to, because they need an education in order to get into certain places. However, if your body of work is really good or like a, a, a hiring manager will go, Hey, you have the skills to do what we need. They're not going to care about your degree. Um, but it helps, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It, it does help, but it is doable. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks Chris. I really appreciate your time and uh, your patience and the way you answer the questions. It's really inspiring and motivational. I, I hope like everybody learned something from you and, uh, yeah, um, I really appreciate yeah. you coming for our meetup event. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on guys. Good luck. Uh, find me on LinkedIn if you want, reach out and, um, yeah, thank you for having me on, man. It's good seeing you. Yeah. Cheers, Chris. Bye. Bye. Thank you.